Welcome to the Hazardous Waste at an Industrial Facility PowerPoint presentation it being presented as part of their Sustainable Resource Manager coursework. I am Kevin Moss, the RECRA and Sustainability Coordinator at the Sickle Mount Refinery. My experience in the Hazardous Waste arena includes five years with US EPA in the RECRA Permitting and Enforcement section, five years at Fermi National Accelerator Laboratory, and the past tw approximately 20 years at the Sickle Lamont Refinery. One general comment before we get started here is that this is a general overview of the waste regulations. It's not intended to provide any specific regulatory guidance or specific training. Always consult with a fully trained waste professional if you have any questions about hazardous waste management or hazardous waste determinations. Okay, let's take a couple of minutes to talk about training, specifically hazardous waste training. Training is a very critical component of any hazardous waste program. There's very specific training that has to be taken before you're qualified to be a hazardous waste worker or a hazardous waste manager. There's really three components to a good hazardous waste training program. The first one is under RECRA, which is the Resource Conservation Recovery Act. These are the hazardous waste regulations. If you look at 40 CFR, CFR is the Code of Federal Regulations. But if you look at 40 CFR 264.16, this is where it outlines specifically what is required under the hazardous waste regulations for training. This training must be completed initially, and there's an annual refresher training that must be taken also. This training must be fully documented. If EPA were to come in, you need to show them exactly how your training program is being implemented. I would strongly recommend that you look at 40 CFR 264.16 to see specifically what the hazardous waste training requirements are. The second component is DOT, which is Department of Transportation. Anybody who's involved in the shipment of hazardous waste, no matter how small or how large the role, must have some level of DOT training. This could be as simple as just knowing that you're using the right containers, or it could be as complicated as knowing what the paperwork, manifesting, placarding, and shipping requirements are for different modes, such as air, uh, train, or by truck. I'd recommend you look at 49 CFR 172.704 to see what the DOT training requirements are. Finally, there's OSHA, which stands for the Occupational Safety and Health Administration. OSHA deals with uh, exposure to hazardous constituents, and depending on how or where the waste is generated, there's different levels of OSHA training that are also required. Again, this could be as simple as just understanding where the MSDS sheets are located at your facility and how to read those MSDS sheets. Or it could be as complicated as a 40-hour HAZWOPER training course. HAZWOPER is spelled H-A-Z-W-O-P-E-R, and that's also an acronym. You should look that up online and see what the OSHA training requirements are for a, hazard, uh, for a HAZWOPER class or you can look at 29 CFR 1910-120, which spells out some of these requirements. So the one thing I do want to stress here is that this PowerPoint presentation does not meet any of these training requirements. If you want to become a hazardous waste manager or a hazardous waste worker, you need to make sure you go to an accredited training class for each one of these, either each one of these components before you're qualified to be a hazardous waste manager or a hazardous waste worker. Okay, let's talk about a few definitions to get started here. In the regulatory world, the terms hazardous materials, hazardous substances, and hazardous waste have, have very specific meanings to very specific programs. They're not interchangeable, although it's very common that someone might say hazardous waste and mean hazardous materials or vice versa. So just to clarify things, let's make sure we talk about what these terms really mean. Um, hazardous materials are defined by the Department of Transportation. Anytime you offer up a material for, for transport and commerce, either by, by rail, by air, or by uh, over the road, the people who are doing that transportation need to know what they're hauling, what the hazards are associated with those things. So DOT came up with a list of literally hundreds and hundreds of these hazardous materials that just describe what the materials are and what the hazards are that are associated by them. This is also useful for any responders to any, re any accidental releases of these material in, while they're in transport. So, again, that's the Department of Transportation. If you're really curious, you can look at 49 CFR 172.101, where you can see what these uh, has material table, what this has material table looks like in the hundreds of materials and how they're defined. Now, hazardous substances are typically individual compounds like toluene, xylene, benzene, or some metals like, uh, uh, you know, cadmium and chrome and lead, that kind of thing. And these are materials that are usually involved with some kind of cleanup activities and how they impact the human health and the environment. Whereas hazardous waste are defined by the Environmental Protection Agency, and this is again a very specific list of materials as they're defined by EPA. Hazardous waste are actually a subset of hazardous materials. So if you're shipping hazardous waste, you go to the hazardous materials table to see how you had to ship those materials. But 
hazardous waste are defined by EPA. Uh, a very common uh, mix-up in these terms, and it's happened to me on a couple occasions, is that you might call a transport and say you have hazardous waste you want to ship, and are they permitted to haul hazardous waste? Well, the transporter sometimes hears that as hazardous materials, and they'll say, sure, we, we are permitted to haul hazardous materials, when you want them to be permitted for hauling hazardous waste. Hazardous waste take a separate permit, a more specific permit to haul, than just hazardous material. So again, you want to make sure you're very clear in your terminology when you're dealing with people in the industry. Okay, so this, this presentation is going to deal primarily with hazardous waste. And those are regulated by the Resource Conservation Recovery Act, the RECRA, as we've already established. Uh, those can be found at uh, 40 CFR Parts 260 to 280. So although we're going to deal primarily with, with hazardous waste, you know, hazardous materials and hazardous substance have the term hazardous in them for a reason. And there's environmental liability if those things do get mismanaged. So it's always good business and good environmental practice to deal with anything that has hazardous materials, hazardous waste, or hazardous substance in an environmentally responsible manner. Otherwise, the liability will never go away. There's always a possibility that somewhere down the road, the EPA or some other agency could come back to you and say that you're liable for a cleanup at a hazardous uncontrolled hazardous waste site because maybe you didn't manage your hazardous materials or hazardous substances properly. Talking about hazardous waste, let's talk about what the different types of waste are, including record hazardous waste and other types of, of waste, regulated waste also. So record hazardous waste. Okay, those are waste that are regulated by the RECRA, uh, Resource Conservation Recovery Act. There's two ways that waste can be hazardous under the RECRA program. The first one's by a listing. A listing means that EPAs define these as hazardous waste. They did studies before the rules were promulgated, and they determined that certain processes or certain industries' waste are always going to be hazardous. There's no testing required. It's just that that waste has been defined by EPA as hazardous. The second way that waste can be hazardous is through a characteristic. This is where you do test the waste. These can be hazards for things like ignitability, corrosivity, reactivity, or toxicity. As an example, benzene, if it leaches out of a waste above half a part per million, 0.5 parts per million, that's a hazardous waste. So if you want more information on what are hazardous wastes, you can look at 40 CFR Part 261. I should mention here also that there are analogous state regulations. In Illinois, they are, they are the state regulations are the Illinois Administrative Code, uh, Part 35, Subpart G. Um, so that's hazardous, that was a record hazardous waste. There's also something called Illinois Special Waste. This is specific just to Illinois. And these wastes include hazardous waste, which are handled by the record program, so you can forget about those for the moment. But it also includes non-hazardous materials, such as potentially infectious medical waste, industrial process waste that are non-hazardous, and pollution control waste that are non-hazardous. Even though they're non-hazardous, you still have this, this waste still needs to be properly characterized, you need hauling permits, you need to have profiles, and characterization profiles done with the disposal facilities. So there's still paperwork and tracking and reporting required for Illinois Special Waste. Okay, continuing with the types of waste. There's universal waste. This is a US EPA definition. And these are waste that would be hazardous, but if they're properly managed, meaning they're recycled or reclaimed, there's a reduced regulatory burden. EPA realized that there were some waste that were high, very high volume with relatively low toxicity, and they decided that was best that they encouraged recycling or reclamation of these materials. Examples of these are fluorescent light bulbs or typical uh, mercury-containing lamps, um, batteries, typically heavy metal type batteries, mercury-containing devices like thermostats, etc., and certain pesticides. If you want to look up more information on universal waste, see 40 CFR Part 273. And then finally, there's recycled material. Obviously, non-hazardous materials that are recycled are, are pretty apparent. But hazardous materials can also be recycled. And if you do recycle hazardous materials, you've got to make sure you understand the exemption fully. Even minor variations can avoid an exemption. So be careful how you apply a hazardous waste exemption for recycled materials. And then what's left over? Well, that's just trash. And that's what's not hazardous, special, universal, or recycled materials. Industrial waste, uh, just some general comments here. Depending on the industry that you're in, you could have just a couple of common wastes that are generated that are routinely generated, and you have those um, identified and characterized properly. Or, like my experience at the refinery, you could have many different types of waste and quantities generated over different periods of time, depending on what's going on in the plant. It could be a maintenance turnaround or some kind of activity that generates waste that are not typically generated. 
So it's important you have a program in place that under, that you understand how waste are generated, when they're generated, and how they're characterized and how they're managed. To that point, when RECRA was first promulgated, the RECRA regulations were commonly referred to as the cradle to grave regulations. What cradle to grave means is that from the point of generation all the way through to ultimate disposal, RECRA regulates those wastes. So if, when the waste is first generated, you characterize it all the way through to when it's disposed of, you have to make sure that's disposed of properly. Industrial waste. Most large industrial facilities are large quiet generators of waste. As a large quiet generator of waste, everything that's generated has to be properly characterized and managed as potentially hazardous. So it doesn't make any difference if it's a small quantity or a large quantity. It all has to be dealt with the same way. So if you have small button type batteries or just a couple spray cans, those have to be dealt with the same way as tons of soil and sludge are dealt with. So again, if you're a large quantity generator, you have to make sure you have programs in place that understand how you when waste is generated, how it's characterized, how it's stored, and then how it's ultimately disposed of. To that point, EPA has the authority to come and visit and inspect the facility at nearly any time they want. So it's important that you have your program in place, that everything is transparent, that when EPA comes in, all your paperwork's in order, and that it's available for EPA to look at when they do want to come in and look at your facility. There is liability involved with dealing with hazardous waste regulations on a personal and at a company level. Um, rec RECRA violations can result in fines up to $37,500 per day per violation. And in the case where you have an economic gain from not complying with the regulations, they can do an, an economic benefit calculation and increase those fines. Since it's $37,500 per day per violation, in some instances, some of these fines can, can add up to many several hundred thousands of dollars. There's also liability. Improper waste management, even non-hazardous waste can have hazardous constituents in it, can result in environmental contamination. So the generator of that waste is usually almost always liable for the cost of any cleanups and any additional regulatory fines. So mismanaging waste now, you might think could save you money initially, but in the long term, it's going to be more costly for you than it would if you managed it properly in the first place. And finally, under liability, is the prospect that criminal charges can be brought against a company or an individual person. These are the most egregious cases where someone knowingly violates an environmental law and causes harm to human health or the environment. But there have been cases where individuals have and been brought up on criminal charges and have gone to jail. Okay, how about some hazardous waste basics? When waste is first generated, per the record regulations, the first thing you have to do is you have to determine if it's hazardous or if it's non-hazardous. And this has to be done upon generation. It can't be done six months or a year later or just whenever you decide you want to get around to it. This has to be done when the waste is first generated. Now this can be accomplished a couple different ways. One's through process knowledge. It's perfectly acceptable if you know exactly what your ingredients are going into the process and you know exactly what's coming out the other end that you know if this material would be hazardous or if it would be non-hazardous. And again, that, that process knowledge, though, needs to be documented. Same with testing. You can test your waste, and you can determine if it fails any of, the, any, of the, any of the waste characteristics, which would be ignitable, corrosive, reactive, or if it's toxic. Again, this testing and determination must be documented. Now, depending on how much waste you generate per month, you can be one of three different categories of a hazardous waste generator. The first one is a conditionally exempt small quantity generator. It's less than 220 pounds of waste per month on average. And as the title would, would, would suggest, it's condition exempt. There, there's very limited regulations you have to deal with as a condition exempt small quantity generator. The next generator status is a small quantity generator. Again, there's more, more requirements as a small quantity generator. And you, this is between 220 and 2200 pounds of hazardous waste per month. And then finally, there's a large quantity generator. This is greater than 2200 pounds per month. Most industrial facilities, including the, including the refinery, are considered large quantity generators. And this is the most highly regulated, most highly scrutinized generator status. Continuing on the hazardous waste basics, once you, have a gener once you generate hazardous waste, you're allowed to store that waste for 90 days for a large quantity generator. Small quantity, just exempt, have lo longer time frames, but for a large quantity generator, it's 90 days. If you store beyond 90 days, 
you need to get a RECRA permit to do that. A RECRA permit process is long and arduous and it's best if you can avoid getting a RECRA permit. But if you know you're going to store waste for more than 90 days, you need to make sure you get a RECRA permit. Um, one of the very basic elements of RECRA also is that waste must be placed directly into properly labeled tanks or containers. Waste going on the ground is, is only allowed in very limited exceptions. And it's best to always think that RECRA waste must be placed directly into properly labeled tanks or containers. You have to store the, those tanks or containers properly, and they need to be labeled properly, and you have to have proper aisle space. They have to be in closed containers in good, con in good condition, non-leaking conditions. And then finally, hazardous waste must be shipped on a hazardous waste manifest. Now, to ship on a manifest, you need to have RECRA training and DOT training. And the ma EPA requirements for manifest are in Part 262 of the CFR Subpart B. Some more has waste facts, things you might want to know. Um, hazardous waste must be shipped off site within 90 days. We talked about that previously. In Illinois, there's an annual hazardous waste report that required, that's required. In this hazardous waste report, you have to identify each type of waste that's generated, where it was shipped specifically to what, what, what treatment facility, the transporter that took it there, their permit numbers, and how, how specifically it was treated. There's also something called the land disposal restrictions, which you can find at 40 CFR Part 268. This is something that most people don't understand or don't know about, but hazardous waste, when it's generated, it cannot be sent directly to a landfill. Only in very, very limited exemptions can that happen. But almost all hazardous waste has to be treated to very low hazardous constituent numbers before it can be landfill. All of Part 268 under, uh, describes what those treatment standards are. There's land disposal restrictions and paperwork that must accompany uh, the manifest that goes along with this to the treatment facility so they understand what the treatment standards are. Now, since this is a, su a sustainability course, we have to talk about waste minimization opportunities. And, you know, many waste, of course, non hazardous waste, but hazardous waste can also be reclaimed and recycled. But it's really critical when you're dealing with hazardous waste that you fully understand the exemption. That, that you're trying to recycle under. If you vary from that exemption at all, you can be in violation of the regulation and that can result in penalties and fines. So as an example for recycling of hazardous waste, in the refining industry there's an exemption for oil bearing hazardous secondary materials that are inserted back into the refining process. The regulatory citation is given if you'd like to look that up. We'll get into more detail in a second. So un under this exemption, only residues that would otherwise typically be hazardous waste are inserted back into the refining process into something called the hot coking process. This is where the oil meets a very hot coke material. It cracks the hydrocarbons. Those hydrocarbons are then recovered. So it's advantageous that we don't generate hazardous waste, and it's advantageous that we actually are recovering hydrocarbons. But like I mentioned, you have to understand the, uh, the exemption to make sure that you are properly applying it. So, as part of that exemption, the coke that's produced cannot have any hazardous constituents above regulatory levels. Um, we mentioned the characteristic levels of toxicity levels, so things like cadmium and chrome and lead, um, benzene, that can't be above the hazardous waste characteristic levels. There has to be legitimate recycling of hydrocarbons. So, when you're putting this material into the coke, you have to be cracking the, cracking the hydrocarbon and recovering that. If there's no hydrocarbon there, no oil there to begin with, then it's, then it's not legitimate recycling. And finally, the other condition, like I mentioned earlier for one of the re basic requisite re conditions, is you cannot place the material, the waste, on the ground. So again, recycling you, has benefits, and the benefits of this exemption is that you recover product hydrocarbon. It's good business, it's good environmental practice. Uh, waste is not shipped over the road or the rail. So. Instead of shipping hundreds, if not thousands, of hazardous waste shipments over the road or rail, um, you're, you're saving in traffic, safety, and pollution issues from, the, from that transportation. Uh, the waste does not need to be treated, so if we ship this material as hazardous waste, it, be sh it would typically be incinerated. And then also, you're saving landfill space from the, what the, the incinerator would, would generate as ash, and that, that, that doesn't go to the landfill and take up landfill space. So that was one example of, uh, of recycling of hazardous waste, but there's other regulatory exemptions. 
and if you look at the CFR, there's a lots there's lots of them there. Again, some are industry specific, others are general. But if you want to recycle hazardous waste, it's understand that you you follow up on these exemptions to see what they are. Um, there's really three of them. Um, well, three sections of the CFR. One is 261.2. This is the definition of solid waste. Table one in, in this in this section provides you direction on the recycling of hazardous and solid waste, what is allowed and what's not allowed, what's hazardous, what's not hazardous. Um, a, a note on solid waste. A hazardous waste must first be determined to be a solid waste. If it's not a solid waste, then it can't be a hazardous waste. So the next one is 261.3. This is the definition of hazardous waste. Again, there's some exemptions for things that are could still be solid waste, but they're not hazardous waste. So 261.3 identifies those. The third area of exemptions is 261.4 of 40 CFR. And these are excluded. These materials that are not even solid waste. EPA says determine that these are not solid waste. As an example for this, uh, spent sulfuric acid that would be used to produce virgin sulfuric acid is not even solid waste. It's considered a product material. So that gets you out of the hazardous waste rule for something that would otherwise be a corrosive hazardous waste. And although RECRA includes resource conservation in its title, the regulatory interpretation of some of these reuse and recycling uh, exemptions can be very difficult to interpret and implement. Again, talk to a trained professional before you were to try to any of these exemptions. It's critical that the reuse and recycling of waste materials are thoroughly vetted. EPA enforcement looks very critically at sham recycling and speculative accumulation. They don't want to find you storing material on your, on your property and saying that, yeah, somewhere down the road you're going to recycle that material. You have to have a program in place and show them that you are, in fact, recycling that material. Again, under the hazardous waste minimization program, we've talked about some of the exemption things you can do, but actually there's some things you have to do under the record program. 40 CFR 262.27 is a certification statement that reads in part that there is a program in place to reduce the volume and toxicity of waste generated. Every time you sign a manifest, you're essentially signing off that you are abiding by 262.27. So there's a lot of ways you can do waste minimization. Uh, for hazardous waste, all within the all within the uh, regulations and the exemptions that I mentioned earlier, uh, I've listed a few of these here below, and I'll try and give you some examples from the refinery as I go through them. Um, first one is a purging and washing of vessels, filters, or tanks before cleaning or removing that material. Waste is generated once you remove it from a processed vessel. So before you remove it from the processed vessel, you can do what you can to reduce the toxicity or the waste that's generated. So, for example, filters. If you have a gasoline filter, you can purge that filter with hot nitrogen or water wash it or whatever to try to remove the toxicity, that, uh, the, the chemicals that are there. So that might either make the filter non-hazardous when you actually do remove it, or at the very least it would reduce the number of, uh, or the amount of, of toxic materials that are on the filters. You can use alternative and less toxic chemicals. For example, here again, we don't use any chlorinated cleaning solvents in the refinery. So we use things that are non-chlorinated. They're not quite as powerful of, of a solvent, but with a little elbow, elbow grease, they accomplish the same thing. You're not dealing with chlorinated solvents, which are highly regulated uh, materials. Uh, recovering metals and hydrocarbons for reuse. We talked about the hydrocarbons with the exemption previously, but recovering metals, for example, refining, refining again, uses a lot of catalysts. A lot of these catalysts are, are made of things like uh, nickel, uh, cobalt, molybdenum, and a majority of these catalysts are sent off-site and the metals are either regenerated or the catalysts are reclaimed. Um, regenerating waste. Uh, we generate quite a bit of carbon for air pollution control. Some of that carbon is hazardous waste. You can send that material to, to certain facilities where they'll regenerate that carbon for reuse again. You can minimize or eliminate the generation waste through engineering and or operational changes. One of our largest waste streams was totally engineered out of existence through a change in our operation and how that material was handled. Uh, waste exchanges, um, just in general, there's a lot of there are a couple different waste exchanges out there. You can find them on the internet if you did a search. But it, it essentially says that one man's garbage is another man's good product. So um, again, you got to make sure that you understand what that is exactly before you start trading your your what would be waste of somebody else to use for something. But it is an option if you carefully uh, uh, employ that. And to, to close the, the full circle here on, on recycling and waste minimization, there's also non-HAZ effort that's going on at the refinery. 
and I'll just mention a few of those. We collect in excess of 100,000 pounds of office recyclables, you know, paper, cardboard, plastic, glass type things every year. We recycle over 200 tons of wood typically in a year. We recycle many tons, 500 tons average of scrap metal every year. We compost our cafeteria food waste. We offer household hazardous waste and electronic collection events for our employees and contractors. We've gone through a lighting um, engineering study where we employed motion sensors and we put more energy efficient fixtures and lamps in place. We track and improve our operational energy usage throughout the whole refinery. Uh, we've constructed a rain garden that reduces ra rain off from our administration building. We sponsor community oil collection and recycling events and we also provide educational outreach to, ed to local schools and, and refinery operation and environmental um, implementation at the refinery and just environmental education in general. So in conclusion, I'd, I'd like to just summarize a few points. Industrial facilities, like a refinery, we, we generate many types of waste and many qu large quantities of different types of waste. So as a result, we're typically large quantity generators or permanent storage facilities. As a result, we're highly scrutinized and highly regulated. To the second point, if you're going to manage hazardous waste, you really need to have extensive knowledge of EPA regulations. You have to go make sure you go through full training for not just the RECRA regulations, but the DOT regulations and OSHA, OSHA regulations. And even non-hazardous waste can have hazardous constituents. So if you're not going to, you need to make sure that you handle these materials properly too. Again, if you mismanage non-hazardous waste that have hazardous constituents, you can still be liable for cleanup and many penalties and fines that come from improper disposal. Finally, waste minimization and just general good environmental practices are both good business and good environmental practices. It makes sense to do things the right way up front and make sure that waste is managed in a good, sound environmental manner.